Recently, I came across this video where Hannah Fry and Matt Parker discussed a chapter of Hannah's and Thomas Evans's book, The Indisputable Existence of Santa Claus. It basically talked about what strategies should be followed in order to win at Monopoly, taking into account aspects like the long-term probability of ending up in a given square and the cost-to-profit ratio of some properties. Both the video and the book are quite interesting, so you should definitely check them out if you want to follow up with the topic after this video. Monopoly is not particularly easy to model, and in order to determine the closest thing to a recipe for success, we should factor in things like the number of players, the cost of each property, the houses and hotel systems, among other things. This is what Hannah does in the book, but I would like to focus on one of these aspects, the long-term probability of ending up in a given square. I thought it would be interesting to explain more in depth how I decided to model the game and the conclusions to which I came, and see if they resembled Hannah's. To begin with, I'm going to model the game using Markov chains. We can think of each square in the board as a state in which the player can be at a given time. Now, we can think of Monopoly as an infinite sequence of squares in the board, randomly determined by dice rolls and a few more things we'll talk about later. In this way, we can express the probabilities of transitioning from one state to another through a matrix. More specifically, the entry A, B of the matrix symbolizes the probability of transitioning from state A to state B in one step. And because all probabilities in a state must add up to one, every row of the matrix must do so too. We'll call this matrix the step transition matrix or just transition matrix of the chain. Since there are 40 squares in the board, our matrix is going to have as many rows and columns. Also, I'll consider the goal square to be square number 1 and roadwalk to be square number 40. Something important to remark is that this is what's called a time homogeneous Markov chain. This means that no matter for how long we've been playing the game, if we are in some square, let's call it A, then the probabilities of transitioning from that space to every other are exactly the same as they were the first time we were there. That's a tongue twister, let me put it more concretely. Let's say if after 14 turns we end up at the go square, the probabilities of going from there to, say, reading station are exactly the same as when we first started the game. This type of model allows us to represent every single probability at any time through a single matrix. Let's continue with the model. First, we have to determine our transition matrix. The first step would be to represent the probabilities when we throw the dice. Since there are 36 possible combinations of the sides of two dice, for each number 2 to 12, the probability of going forward that amount of squares would be the number of combinations which add up to that number divided by 36. Pay close attention to 6, 7 and 8, because they'll play an important role when we calculate the long-term probabilities. So, with this in mind, we can now add some numbers to our currently zero matrix. The probabilities we just saw represent the chances of going from one square to the next 12 squares. Clearly, the probability of moving forward only one square is zero, because we have two dice. Great! This is a huge step towards completing our model. However, we need to take into account some quirks I hinted at earlier, which make Monopoly less easily predictable, as they can greatly modify the chances of ending up in some squares in the long term. Namely, three things concern us. Firstly, the go-to-jail square, which immediately sends us to jail every time we get to it. Secondly, we have the chance and community chess cards, some of which send the player to different squares on the board. And last but not least, the doubles system, where if a player gets two equal faces in a dice roll three times in a row, they are sent to jail. Let's tackle these one by one. The first one's easy. When we end up in the go-to-jail square, we are sent to jail immediately without fail. This means that the probability of going from this square to every other except jail is zero. So the row of our transition matrix, let's name it P, corresponding to go to jail is just a bunch of zeros, except in the jail square, where there is a one. Moving on to the chance and community chest squares, these are all the places this type of square can send us to. Now, how can we faithfully represent this game mechanic in our matrix P? Well, there are in total 32 chance and community chess cards, 16 of each. So one thing we could do is this. If a square has non-zero probability p of going forward to, say, a chance square, then because there are 10 out of 16 cards that lead us elsewhere, we can add 1 16th of p to each place it can lead us to, and then subtract the sum of these tiny amounts from p by multiplying it by 3 eighths, that is, 6 sixteenths. The same can be done with community chess squares, 
only 2 out of 16 cards send us away from the community chest, so we could add the 1 16th of P to the corresponding entry in the matrix, and then we would scale P by 14 sixteenths. Remember, every row of P has to add up to 1, so if we slightly modify some value, we have to make sure we balance some other values in the row in order to maintain the sum. Which leads me to doubles, because this is exactly what we'll have to do here. I couldn't think of a way to represent the double system exactly as it is carried out in-game. But I think that if we transmit the effect this has on the probabilities through a single number, we would be able to model it quite faithfully. What I ended up with is this. Since there are 6 possible double dice rolls, at any given time the probability of rolling doubles is 1 sixth. So the probability of rolling doubles 3 times in a row would be 1 over 6 to the 3rd power. To balance the fact that this must happens at most every 3 dice rolls, I divided it by 3. Then we have this constant, let's call it epsilon, which we have to add to the probability of going to jail at every square. But how do we balance the rest of the probabilities so its sum is still 1? Well, it's a simple equation. If the entries of this row of p are p sub i, with i ranging from 1 to 40, we know that their sum is 1. So if we add epsilon to the equation, we should find some number alpha, so that if we multiply all this by alpha, the equation holds. This may seem like a lot to take in, but I hope these equations illustrate just how simple it is. And so we get the value 1 over 1 plus epsilon for alpha. Now that we have constructed our step transition matrix, we can move on to the interesting part, calculating the limit probabilities. As I said at the beginning of the video, we are particularly interested in calculating how frequently we are going to arrive at a given square in the board after many turns. In our Markov chain model, this translates into obtaining something called the limiting distribution of the chain. Basically, it's the limit of our matrix P to the nth power as n goes to infinity, but we can think of it as a vector for now, since all the rows of the limit matrix will be equal to this vector. Now, because P is a matrix, this limit is by no means trivial and may not even exist in some cases, but there are tools and characterizations that help simplify calculations by relating this distribution to another one, the stationary distribution of the chain. Intuitively, if we set this as the initial distribution, the resulting probabilities for every square in the board would be completely given by P, as opposed to this vector pi times P. Therefore, we can say that the stationary distribution pi satisfies the equation pi times p equals p. And moreover, it has been proven that for every transition matrix p, there is a unique solution pi whose elements sum 1. Now, I don't want to bore you with the heavy side of Markov chain theory, and I did just branch off a little bit, but I think it's important to point out another theorem that guarantees the existence of the limiting distribution for the type of matrix we are working with right now. Turns out, the chain we're using to model monopoly is what's called an ergodic chain. This means, among some other things, that all states are recurrent, or simply that there's always a positive chance to come back to a given square after some number of turns. And, as you may have expected, limiting distributions are a bit more straightforward to calculate in this type of chain. Specifically, there's a theorem cleverly called the Fundamental Limit Theorem for Ergodic Markov Chains, which states that the limit distribution of an ergodic chain is exactly the same as its stationary distribution. And so, we no longer have to solve some sort of matricial limit. All we have to do is solve this system of equations for our matrix P. With the assistance of some software, we now have before us the limiting distribution of our Markov chain. Let's visualize it in a different way so that the limiting distribution becomes the secret to monopoly. The number inside each square is its rank in terms of how frequently we'll end up there in the long term. This is incredibly useful for a number of reasons. We can see that the place we'll walk by most frequently is actually jail. This may seem underwhelming at first, but remember when I told you that 6s, 7s and 8s were quite important? Well, at any given square we saw that when only considering dice probabilities, we were most likely to advance 7 squares, followed by 6 and 8 squares. With the information that we have now, we could pretty confidently predict that the places 6, 7 and 8 squares away from jail will be visited rather frequently, and so will be the places this distance away from them. As we can see, this is exactly what happens. The most frequent squares are concentrated in the upper left section of the board. So next time you're trying to absolutely destroy your friends when playing Monopoly, you now know that you should try to buy the orange and red properties.
Also, leave the classic fight over Broadwalk and Park Place to your friends. They don't end up being as tempting as the other properties. Now that we know Park Place is one of the worst ranked squares in the board. Another thing worth mentioning is, railroads rank quite high in our list, but they may not be the best option, since you can't build houses or hotels there, and therefore you probably won't earn as much money with them as you would with properties. But I would be remiss to claim this is the definitive, absolute, mathematically proven rank of properties to buy. Remember, this is only based on how frequently we'll pass through the squares. The amount of money we can earn from each square, for example, this is definitely an important factor to consider, and even though I think this is a good estimate, taking money into account may place more importance on seemingly bad squares. I want to end this video by acknowledging math. I think this is a prime example of just how useful math is to model, idealize, and abstract oneself from situations, and through this abstraction be able to solve an enormous number of problems through one generalization. It never ceases to amaze me. I hope this video made you love math just a bit more, or at least made you appreciate how rather easily we were able to crack the code of a complex game using tools developed over a hundred years ago. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing. The validation is always great. See you next time.